Hello, I am Reverend Irene Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to Generationally Speaking. Here at the table, we come and we discuss life issues, no matter what they might be. As we sit at the table with each generation, we all learn, we all grow, we all are inspired. Yeah, yeah. Generationally Speaking. Hello, I am Reverend Irene Smith, and I want to welcome you to Generationally Speaking. Hey, is where we come to the table. Every generation, our, our uh, ancestors, our, our older generation, as they share with us uh, how they made it over. And our younger generation, this, this technological age generation, as they share with us all this technology and how they're using it in such a great way. And then we hear the voices of our younger peeps, those who uh, we hear their aspirations of their hopes and their dreams. Well, I'm always excited to, to come to the table in this International Women's History Month that we are celebrating, I am just so excited about who God has brought uh, to me, to the table, to Generationally Speaking, to share their journey. My heart just beats, beats, beats as I celebrate these women and what they're doing. I celebrate these women and the successes that they've had. I celebrate these women for the journey that they have traveled. And today I bring another uh, awesome uh, young woman to you to hear more about her journey. Let me um, uh, welcome Bibiani. Hey guys, I'm Bibiano. Nice to meet everybody. And um, Bibiani, uh, just for our audience to get to know you, tell uh, us a little bit about who this young woman uh, was, your early years, uh, your formative years, that, that, that uh, when you were in um, elementary and middle school and high school, and, and tell us something about your parents. Okay, so uh, my name is Bibiana, and uh, currently, right now, I'm 32 years old. Um, I came to the U.S. in 1996 with my parents. Uh, so I'm originally from Sudan, uh, Africa. I was born in Khartoum, Sudan, which is North Sudan. Um, it's divided right now into North and South Sudan, for those of you that know your geography. Um, but yes, we came over here, you know, with the whole uh, American dream, and I am very fortunate because I think within my family, being the oldest of five, um, I have been the one to make that picture, you know, the American dream for our family um, and for our African community. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. Wait so a minute. Hold up. Stop right there. I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> just right there along. Okay. Okay. So for my audience, okay, she's coming from Sudan. Okay. That, yeah. And she's and she let you know from uh, Africa. Uh, and then she says she goes to Fargo. Fargo. <laughs> Now, when you, if you know anything about North Dakota or South Dakota, you know very well. Y'all know. a few people with some hues. And so now tell us about that experience. And for you, I mean, to go to, to Flatland and to, what, what, what was it for you to, to, to even be able, be able to comprehend? So that is a really good question. Um, all my clients always ask me and they love <laughs> when I tell them this story. So, um. When we came here, we actually landed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, me, my mom, and my sister. So there's five of us currently. I have uh, five kids, like, in our family. But uh, just me and my sister came over here with my mom. My dad was already here. He had got our paperwork and everything together. Um, but we landed in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I kid you not, we literally only had, like, our, like, just our uh, traditional gowns and, like, sandals. You know, that's how we got here. And uh, I remember when we landed in Minneapolis, No, don't nobody take this wrong, but I was like, why is everybody white? I was like, where, is all, where are all the black people? Um, and me and my sister instantly started crying because it was that and it was cold and we didn't have the proper gear. So I remember um, we came with no coat, nothing. Like I remember we had, we walked in snow with our sandals. I remember that. And I remember telling my dad, I was like, when are we going back home? Because it was just so bad. He had met us there. But um, 
it was just such a bad experience getting here because it was so different. But eventually, you know, we, we got coats and we got shoes and stuff like that. Uh, my dad had that stuff for us. But that was our first time coming here, and that was the experience. Um, but, yeah, that's how we so, got here. So tell us a little bit about the language. Did, was there, was, and I, what I've learned about uh, persons who come from Africa, they are usually <laughs> multilingual. Oh, yeah. Unlike, unlike Americans. But <laughs> So... Um, so my first language is Arabic and we say Arabic. So I speak Arabic as my first language and then English is my second language. Um, when I first came here as a child, I spoke Swahili, mm -hmm. but I lost it. I used to write Arabic, read it. I lost that um, because I was so young and I had to, I had to learn, you know, the English and I had to learn the, and adapt. So I kind of lost all that because I wasn't using it anyway. Um, but my parents, um, they are very special. My dad and my mom, they're very, very bilingual in very many different languages. They have their, they have Arabi, which is like English for us in America. It's kind of one of the main languages um, in Africa. And then they have their tribe languages. And then both my parents, they're from two different tribes. They're not from the same tribe. So they understand one another's uh, tribe languages, also their own. Um, I know I have some family members also, including my parents, uh, understanding a little bit of French even. Um, so they're very, very bilingual, which is amazing to me. I mean, now I just have ought to be in English. So. And you know, I think it's interesting for my audience that she brings up her parents uh, came from two different tribes, but yet they were able to understand oh, their, yes. tri their tribal languages. That is not always the case. So um, that's saying a lot about them. You know? Oh, yes. Um, and when, when we would have um, like celebrations or uh, graduation birthday parties, you know, depending on what tribe you were from, even with my cousins or friends um, in the Af uh, African community in Fargo, North Dakota, you always understood the other tribe. Like I didn't speak. So my mom, she's from the what we call Kuku tribe. Mm -hmm. And then my dad is from what we call the Madi tribe. Um, I don't speak it fluently, but I know what is being said. You know what I mean? I always know kind of what's going on. Um, and that's just how it is. We, are, we You might not know it to the T, but you're going to understand what is going on at all times. And that's just kind of how it is in our culture. So tell us a little bit about how the, that community is created, uh, it have been created for, by the Africans in these various uh, places and in, in, in locations that they live in. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so Atlanta, Atlanta is actually a hub. Um, I know Clarkson here in Georgia is a hub for a lot of immigrants that come in from other countries. Uh, but Fargo, North Dakota is also another hub. Most people don't go there because of the cold and because of the culture. Uh, but my dad and uh, some of my family and uh, similar tribe members, we ended up in Fargo, North Dakota because of the schooling system. And then the support system there is a lot more, I don't want to say positive, but it's a lot more, you just, you just get a lot more, you know, we came, when we came, um, we had a lot more help and a lot more support, if that makes sense. Right. So like, if you come here, for example, let's say you have seven kids and you come to Atlanta, you're going to basically take what they give you, um, you know what I mean? Whatever sponsor you get to help you uh, get uh, adapted to being here, that's what you're going to get. Whereas in Fargo, North Dakota, if you have seven kids, they're going to make sure that you are in a place that can hold your whole family. You see what I'm saying? Um, so it, because it's a smaller space, it's not like a big space where they have millions of people coming in. So you're just a number. So my dad was like, we're going to go to Fargo, it's going to be very different, but they had a really good schooling system. It was one of the safest places to live when we came. And so he wanted to start small before we started to like move out into other states or anywhere else. So we ended up there. But as soon as I was 17, I, <laughs> I had to go. <laughs> so tell us about elementary, your elementary and, and middle school and high school years there. Okay, so... Um, I actually remember a lot of that because I was so different. Um, <laughs> elementary and all that was really hard for me because it got better around middle school and high school because I started to understand um, the English language and the American like culture better. 
So I was able to fit in and disguise a little bit. But when I first came, it was very obvious that obviously, you know, I wasn't from here. And I hated it as a kid because, you know, you don't understand being different when you're a child. So my name was different. I looked different. I always had short, I had short hair. That's how we came here. Um, and it was just easier for my mom at the time because it was just a lot, it was a lot of stress. So me and my sister, we both had short hair. We looked like boys, mm -hmm. um, although we were girls. And that was also another hard thing for me to go to school that way. So um, I had a hard time identifying, I guess, with females and stuff like that. But I always felt left out. Um, my teachers always tried to do a good job of including me, but I was always the only Black person in the class. My name was hard to pronounce. It was always butchered. And then I always got pulled out of my classes. I mean, this is not in a negative way. We're just talking, but me and my sister both always got pulled out of class for what is called ELL classes. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just classes that we would have to go to on the side just so they could make sure we were where we needed to be. Mm -hmm. um, but it always made me feel different because I was like, well, why isn't anybody else getting pulled out? Why are we just getting pulled, you know? So, uh, I mean, I'm grateful for those classes now, but at the time I didn't understand and I did not like them because literally the classes would be like, what is this? And it would be a bike. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it would just be like, oh my goodness, I know what these things are, but they would constantly do them and pull us out of class. Even if I was in art class or doing something fun, they'd be like, okay, you have ELL now. And I was just like, oh my gosh. But uh, my experience, I think during elementary was kind of hard because it was hard to understand. And then I couldn't get the understanding from my parents because they were learning too right so my dad was always like you know just go with it go with it it's a positive experience it's there for you to learn um but it was really hard because uh even for my parents my they still had trust issues being in a different culture so my dad put a lot of pressure on my mom when we would come home he would put a lot of pressure on her to make sure like make sure these kids know what these English words me mean, make sure they know their alphabets, make sure they know the numbers, make sure they know their basic math. So it was a lot of pressure, I think, in our household. It was positive pressure because it was learning. We were just trying to learn and keep up just so we can survive. Um, and my dad, he is like, he's an African like prophet. I love my dad. Um, he's a pillar of our family. Um, I have come as far as I've come because of him. Um, but, uh, he's a very spiritual person, but I know that he was always, uh, just on top of my mom, make sure my kids know this X, Y, Z, you know what I mean? And my mom would be like, well, they're already learning this in school. And he'd be like, no, we can't rely on the system or whatever. He never wanted to be in the system. You know, we, we always got, uh, benefits or, um, like EBT. My dad did not want that. He, he made it a point. He was like, no, we are going to do exactly what everybody else is doing. That was his whole thing. You know, he was like, I don't, we don't need help. We can do it ourselves, you know? So we worked very hard and I commend my parents because that's why I'm here the way that I am. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I think it's, um, it's good to hear a lot of what, what I hear from a lot of families is mm -hmm. education. Education is critical. Education oh, is yeah. so important. Oh, it's yes. the key and parents uh that is one thing that they push that they want their children to be well educated and put them in yep. the best environment that they can mm -hmm. so when you got to middle school and high school now now you've been a little more indoctrinated and yep. folks know you so now d does bibiana begin to show her personality yes yes <laughs> oh my gosh so the transition, the transition slowly started happening. Like, I think it was like my fourth, fifth grade photo. I, I have to find this photo. I got to ask my dad because um, I went to school. My dad dropped me off. And this is, this is so funny. But I went to school. My dad dropped me off. I still have short hair at this time. I don't have hair. I'm just like, why do I not have hair? Like, what is going on? Um, but I would try to like decor myself and decorate myself. You know what I mean? So when I took my school pick, I went to school with like a really cute, I had like hearts on it. It was a white turtleneck. I had hearts all over my shirt. But when my parents got the pick, I had like lipstick on my lips and my parents were like, what? And then I had a, some, some, something I put in my hair and my parents were like, Where, what is this? Um, where did you get the makeup? 
<laughs> it was actually red permanent marker that I put on my lips to take my school pig so I could feel like a girl. Cause I was like, y'all got me out here like looking crazy, you know? Against these white girls with like all oh, this long hair. I was like, no. Um, so it was that's just a little story from elementary, but when I got to uh, middle school and high school, it got a little bit better, but I started understanding the culture a little bit more, but I started going to school with my cousins. I had cousins and a lot of family that I went to school with, and um, they were a lot older than me, but we started bonding in a way where it was kind of negative because now we started meeting with all the other Black kids, you know what I mean? So I was like, oh, yeah, this is, how, this is how it's supposed to go. But we started getting into trouble. So my dad pulled us out of the public school system and put us in a Catholic private school, which I hated. So then in high school, I was back to square one being the only like <laughs> black girl in the classroom. I was just like, what the hell? <laughs> um, but I'm grateful that he did that because it actually really helped shape me. And I went to school with some amazing kids. Um, and I got, I got an experience that I don't think I would have got. I went to like a um, college prep high school, Catholic school, uh, but it really helped shape me. And I think it helped shape my future and, and me and my siblings as well too. So I am glad that it happened as hard as it was at the time. You know, when you're younger, you, you just don't understand. Yeah. But my dad was like, no, you are not going to school, you know, with your cousins because it was a lot of trouble. It was a lot of fun but it was a lot of trouble. <laughs> so you, you, you know, you, uh, my next question was those pivotal moments that changed your life. And one of mm -hmm. those pivotal moments I hear is your father who uh, said, no, I'm pulling you out of this school and I'm going to put you into this um, Catholic school. And even though it wasn't where you wanted to be and wasn't the experience you wanted, but at, as you said, it was a great, it was a great place. So are there other pivotal moments in your life where you can look back now and say, you know what? It didn't feel so good then, but I'm so thankful that it happened like that. I'm so glad my parents stepped up. I'm so glad my friends stepped up and said, hey, you don't want to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, that moment, uh, like my high school, my whole high school experience. Um, and then also, too, I had moved out of Fargo, North Dakota, and I wanted to move into a big city because Fargo now probably has a total of like maybe 100K people, we'll say. And now I live in a state where it's like 6 million people, you know? <laughs> so um, before I moved out here, I had moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, back where we had first came when we came here to the U.S. Um, I had moved there just to kind of uh, slowly adjust to living in a bigger city. Um, and it was kind of the same thing. I, I found myself kind of in the same ruts, um, same crowd of people, same problems, same, you know what I mean? And um, I knew I wanted more for myself. I had a very close relationship with my dad and he was very, uh, he's very hard on us, not in a bad way, but very, very, uh, very hard in a constructive way. You know, he would always be like, Viviana, what are you doing? You know what I mean? That's his perfect thing to tell me. And I'd be like, I don't know, you know? Um, and if I didn't know what I was doing, he'd be like, okay, so you got to switch something up here. You're not, I didn't bring you over here for this. You know, you're not where you need to be. So when I was living in Minneapolis, um, I had I had good friends, but it was kind of toxic. And um, when I graduated out of college, that was a turning point for me because I if so in our in our community, if you're not doing well, it's not just your parents that are going to talk to you. It's going to be your aunts and uncle. It's going to be everybody within the tribe. You're going to hear from everybody because they they raised you. They know who you are. They babysat you. So if they see that you're not following the path that you need to be on, um, they're going to randomly call you and they're going to they're gonna give it to you. So I got tired of that in college. And when I graduated and they threw me my graduation party, I had like three graduation parties because that's just how we are and where we're from. And um, literally everybody was just like, you know, you cannot fail us. <laughs> that's Yeah, it's amazing you say that because the energy. Uh, yeah, in the in the. And I, I think that, you know, as I think about the Black family uh, yeah. who were enslaved here in America and, you know, and, and now generations later, mm -hmm. that was always important was education. And it was always that tribe of family that was around. Oh, yes. You. And yeah. that tribe was always pushing you. And, yeah. and, 
and encouraging you. And when you when you did something wrong, you know, they would get on you. And, oh and yeah. They, they would get on you in such a way that they they would tell you, you can do better than this. Oh we yeah. Expect more than we expect more from you, you know. Oh yeah. Everybody, the, the expectation. Oh, yeah. But you talked about toxic friends. And I think that is a great place to, to have a, a, a conversation. What do you do when you find out? And what did you do when you found out that the people around you were toxic and they really wasn't adding anything to you to your story? In fact, they were taken away. Oh yeah. Um, because one thing that has always been embedded in me is I work really hard. So even I've been working since I was like 14. I started driving when I was 14. Like I was just trained because I was, I'm the oldest of five. So I was trained to just like do well. I was trained to be successful. That was just something both my parents shed in me. So um, when I didn't have them anymore and I was out in the real world by myself, I realized like I, I still had those traits, but when I was around people, I had it. But then when they were gone, I had zero. You know what I mean? I had no money. Mm -hmm. I would be broke and I'll be sad mm -hmm. and I'd be like why am I here why do I feel like this? um I was in a also a relationship that it just wasn't getting me anywhere mm -hmm. so eventually I, I just got sick of feeling down mm -hmm. um but even in Minneapolis one thing about the African community no matter where you go it's almost like you have to check in Okay. So even in Minneapolis, when I was there, my parents weren't there, but there was a lot of people that knew me as a kid there. So they always kept an eye on me. They always kind of reported to my parents, you know, my dad would be like, so-and-so is saying, you know, you know, what are you doing? You know what I mean? And it just sucks to hear that, especially when I, I have so much respect for my dad and my mom. So it just sucks to like hear that. So when they would come back and report, it's almost like somebody would tell on you, you know what I mean, on the low. And you'd be like, how do you know that? You know what I mean? So I'm hanging out with my cousins. Next thing you know, my dad's like, yeah, so you're partying too much. You're with so-and-so, you know, again, we didn't come here. I didn't bring you here. I didn't sacrifice my whole life and future for you to come here and be doing this. And my dad, he, didn't, he had no problem slapping that in our face. Cause that's the best comeback. You know what I mean? Cause he yeah. didn't do a lot for us. Yeah. Literally his whole life. He brought us over here because he just, there would have been no opportunity for us had we stayed where we were at, you know, and he wanted a bigger family. So when we came out here, he was like, I brought y'all out here. Y'all got the opportunity. So like, you know, make me proud, but make your, make your future, you know? So Eventually, I came to my senses because I was tired of getting zero, zero, zero in my relationship and my friends. And I randomly just, uh, it just hit me and dawned on me. I was like, I have to move. I was like, I have to move somewhere um, that caters to, that is caters to my career. So I was like, I have to move to a state or some, just somewhere different. I had to get away because I wasn't even happy because of the cold, the snow. The snow will bring a, a completely different <laughs> different side of us I was negative and then I had negativity around me I had toxicity around me so I made the decision I was like I'm going to move to one of the major hair meccas because I'm in the beauty industry so um, between six like major cities I picked Atlanta I visited Atlanta one time and what dragged me over here was um, just all the black people that's what I yearned for, like literally my whole life living in Fargo. I was like, where are all the black people? Like, and they're in Atlanta. So I moved here. <laughs> I moved here after one visit at 22 years old by myself. Everyone thought I was crazy. <laughs> so, so when you went to Minnesota, did, was that college that you went to Minnesota? Um, so I went to uh, M State in, uh, in Minnesota and I just went for my business degree. Um, at first, I went to school for criminal justice, but I was only in it for a month. And then after that, um, because I was just like, I, I couldn't, I'm too creative. I didn't know if I was really, truly going to be happy just doing like that type of work. Right, I was right. like, I was an artist. I used to um, be in all the like uh, drawing contests, painting contests. My parents would enter me into all this artistic stuff when I was a kid and I would win. Like for our church, I would win money, I would win this. And so I was like, I have to do something that where I can still do that because I knew that's what really brought me joy, you know? Yeah. Um, so I ended up 
uh, going into the beauty industry. Both my parents were going to disown me because my dad was like, I did not bring you here. This is his one thing. You did not come to America to do hair. Like, come on. You know what I mean? He was like, you need to go and be a teacher. You need to go and be like a police officer, a lawyer, a doctor. That's in our culture. That's what you're bred to do because that's what we, that's what we, uh, is value for us. Right. Um, it's amazing that, that the, the, the things you say is so amazing that I'm hearing because it's the same, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a, a, a picture of, of, of the black community here. It's like, they want, there are certain jobs that they want you to aspire to, you know, exactly. teacher, lawyer, um, um, uh, doctor, yeah, something, um, so all of those kinds of things. But now, um, I thank God that that the door has opened for more creative types exactly. of professions that you can go into and become and be very successful. And exactly, it becomes your passion is something that you love. So mm -hmm. it's good to know that you held on to that.